Okay, so before we get started with the lab for module two, uh, for module two, I just wanted to go over um, a really quick presentation about an introduction to uh, the software that we're going to be using, IGV. Um, in reality, we could probably give an entire day's workshop on how to use IGV and the different things that we use, but we only have an hour, so um, I just want to give you kind of the, the basics before uh, you get started on your own. So Richard mentioned a lot of different file types. Um, they all seem to be, uh, for the most part, pretty text heavy, text based. Um, but what do we do with them and how do we interpret them? Um, I don't know about you, but I'm definitely a very much a visual person. Um, text doesn't mean a whole lot to me. It's a lot easier if I can actually look and see what's going on. So one of the things that we can do is visualize uh, some of this genomic information. We will be using IGV for this lab. Uh, it's one of many genome browser tools available. Um, UCSC Genome Browser is a really popular web-based one. Um, but IGV is a pretty popular um, kind of downloadable one as well. And it supports many different file types. Uh, you can look at DNA alignments, RNA alignments, uh, DNA methylation data, ChIP-seq data, BCF files, and many more. But I think most commonly IGV is used to view uh, DNA and RNA alignments. And uh, these files can be um, either stored on your computer or you can um, actually pull them from the cloud if they're hosted online. So once you launch IGV, you should see a screen that looks like this. Uh, the first thing you want to do is make sure you have the correct reference genome uh, selected. So this is a pretty old screenshot here. Um, at the very least, you should be using HG19 if you're working with humans. If you don't have the correct reference genome, um, everything is, is going to look very wrong. Your alignments are going to look uh, terrible. And um, from here, you can then load your data, um, again, as I said, from a file on your computer or from a URL or server. This is an example of some methylation data, I believe. And here is a breakdown of what everything is. So at the top, you have your menu bar, like you do with pretty much um, any app. The toolbar along here, uh, this is where you load the reference genome. Uh, there are buttons to zoom in and out um, of the different genomic regions. The search bar allows you to type in genomic coordinates to quickly navigate to regions of interest. And uh, there's this genome ruler underneath, uh, which indicates which region of the genome you are currently viewing. So when you first start, it'll give you an overview of all of the chromosomes. When you actually view into a specific region, you'll get an ideogram of a specific chromosome. The tracks, um, so each uh, data set here, um, these are the actual data that you've loaded into the data panel, which takes up the bulk of the screen. Each data set gets a, a separate track in the middle, and the track names are indicated on the left-hand panel. There is an optional um, attributes panel. We're not going to be using it today. Um, but it is available if you want to, if you're looking at a bunch of different samples at once and you want to distinguish them uh, by certain phenotypic attributes or metadata, uh, such as if it's a tumor sample or if it's normal. And then there's this uh, genome features track, excuse me, along the bottom. Uh, and it has different annotations of the genome, such as uh, the location of rough seq genes. Once your um, file is loaded, um, if you're loading a BAM file, you'll see a coverage track as well pop up for each BAM file that you load. And this shows how many reads um, are covering uh, any particular region that you're looking into. And you're gonna have to zoom in to see the actual alignments. This is because BAM files can be extremely large, contain you know, several gigabytes of data, and trying to load that all at once onto your computer is going to absolutely freeze and cause uh, problems. So if I showed you this screen here and said, how many variants on this screenshot? How can you tell? Like how quickly can you see? Can anyone give me a number? All right, I'm not gonna make you do that. Um, how about now? How many variants can you see? Four. Four, there should be five. There's four C's. Oh yes, and one G. Down here as well. 
Yeah. So it's a lot easier to identify anomalies when only the anomalies are highlighted. And IGB makes really good use of color coding information in order to make uh, viewing variants easier on you. So uh, the default settings are each read uh, is a gray arrow and they are aligned to the reference genome. The reference genome is displayed at the bottom. Each base gets its own color. If you zoom in far enough, you'll actually see the letters in both the reference genome and in the reads as well, or in the, uh, the mismatch reads at least. And for the reads, they are uh, gray if they match the reference and, or sorry, in the reads, the bases are gray if they match the reference, so they don't show up, um, but they're colored if they don't match. It might be a bit hard to see in these slides, but the mismatched bases are also different intensities depending on the base quality score uh, as was determined by the sequencing technology. So solid colors have a very high base quality, whereas these really faint colors, uh, they're very low quality and it's probably a you know, sequencing error or an artifact as opposed to an actual variant. Coloring the reads themselves can also help you identify artifacts um, and structural variants as well. So here the reads are no longer gray, but they are red and blue uh, for forward and reverse orientation. So if you look at uh, this position here, um, if these reads were gray, you would say, okay, yeah, that's a pretty good indication that there is a, a single nucleotide variant here. But if you look at the orientation, the variant only occurs on the reverse read. So it will kind of make you question the validity of this particular step. And you can maybe rule out certain uh, false positives this way. So taking a step back um, as a refresher, during paired end sequencing library preparation, DNA is sheared into fragments and only the, the ends of the, the fragment are actually sequenced. So, um, you know, from one end going in, the other end coming from the other direction. So we expect the read pairs to be oriented left to right when they're mapped back to the reference genome. And if we see reads in other orientations, it doesn't mean that something has gone horribly wrong during sequencing. Uh, it's instead, it suggests that there is a structural variant in the sample that causes the, the read orientations uh, to look a bit weird when those reads are mapped back to the reference genome. So basically, the, that sequence of that particular segment is different in your sample than it is in the reference genome. So these left-left or right-right pairs are seen in inversions and are colored uh, teal and blue, respectively. And I don't have time to go into you know, the specific details of how this all works, but the IGB user manual online gives a pretty good uh, thorough explanation. And if you have reads kind of facing the opposite way, if they're going right-left, uh, this might be indicative of a tandem duplication uh, as depicted here or as uh, a translocation within the same chromosome. So in this example, um, this is an inversion. Uh, we've colored the reads by read pair orientation. And so we can see there are um, a bunch of reads um, in incorrect orientations with their mates as well, you can look at uh, the coverage track and see that there is a drop in coverage around the same position. So you can use multiple tracks to kind of confirm or validate what might be going on in a particular sample. Uh, so also, uh, during line library prep, the fragments, you generally uh, undergo size selection to try to select fragments that are roughly the same size. And so that means that they have, um, your read pairs have uh, an expected insert size. So the insert is the distance from the end of the first read to the end of the second read. So when you map your reads back to the reference, a lot of aligners will use this expected insert size to try to find the best mapping if there's multiple places it can map. Um, but we can um, use information about um, 
sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Um, you know, insert read, read pairs with insert sizes that are either smaller than expected or larger than expected in order to detect, detect structural variants. So if a fragment originates from a region with a large deletion or insertion, the inferred insert size or the insert size when it's mapped back to the reference genome, it changes. It's either going to get larger if it's a deletion or smaller if it's an insertion. And hopefully um, you can see why in these figures here. So read pairs with a larger than expected insert size are colored red and ones with a smaller than expected insert size are colored blue. As well, um, interchromosomal rearrangements can be detected when, um, each, when a read mate maps to a different chromosome, or sorry, when a read maps to a different chromosome from its mate. You know, we would expect them all, uh, both pairs of, or sorry, both reads in a pair to map to the same chromosome at least. But if there's um, a translocation, they can often map to different chromosomes. And when this happens, the reads are colored according to which chromosome their mate is aligned to. And I'll show you an example of this in a second. First, uh, an example of looking at a large deletion. So you can see that the read pairs are colored red because these particular reads, uh, these pairings have an insert size that is larger than expected. There's also a drop in the coverage track again, so we can see that um, you know this is this is a deletion. There are fewer reads covering this region, and we have these larger than expected insert sizes. So we can kind of uh, feel that there's there's a deletion in this area. And an example of a rearrangement or translocation in here, um, we're actually looking at two different regions at the same time with an IGV and a split screen. And we're looking at two different samples. So this is a tumor sample up top, a normal sample underneath. In chromosome one, some of the reads in the tumor are colored orange. And when we look at uh, the chart of the, um, the, sorry, if I go back a step, if reads are mapped on different chromosomes from their mates, that's an undefined insert size. You can't quantify that difference because they're on, they're on different chromosomes. So this undefined insert size uh, legend here will tell you where which chromosome its mate is mapped to. So orange here means chromosome six. And sure enough, if we look up um, chromosome, look at chromosome six and see uh, the reads, um, that uh, correspond to these roots here. These ones are also colored blue, indicating that their mates are mapped to chromosome one. So speaking of tumors, um, what do we have to keep in mind when viewing alignments from cancer samples? I think the main thing would be um, considering that tr for true germline variants, you would expect the frequency of a variant allele to be either 0.5 or 1. So roughly half of the reads should carry a variant if the sample is heterozygous at this position, and nearly all the reads should carry a variant if it's homozygous. But somatic variants have a variable frequency. It can be very low or very high and anywhere in between due to tumor heterogeneity, as Trevor talked about in his intro lecture. And oftentimes, you need really deep coverage or high coverage uh, of your sample in order to identify these somatic variants if they occur at a very low frequency. And it's not always easy to tell if a variant is somatic or if it's actually a sequencing artifact. And so that's why we don't really do things by eye. We use cancer-specific software to confirm these variants. And you'll use um, a few of these tools tomorrow and in the next day to actually determine variants from cancer data. But it can be helpful to view potential variants in a browser like IGB, either to confirm um, confirm a variant or identify signs that a variant might be an artifact or a false positive. 